Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our English language service here at Salem. It's lovely to be with you, and hello also to anybody who's going to be watching this on YouTube later. This week, and in fact, even in the last hour, I've had several conversations with people who are finding life so hard at the moment. The restrictions of lockdown, just that feeling of utter exhaustion and lack of energy worrying about the future, the trouble of uh, homeschooling children, illness, bereavement. But, you know, almost in the same breath, people say to me, but we mustn't moan because after all, it's much harder for other people and you've got to stay positive. And of course, on the one hand, that's absolutely true. But also, you know, we all need a space and a time when we can just be honest and say quite simply, I'm not okay. And perhaps as Christians, we feel a bit of pressure that we need to be OK all the time, that we need to know all the answers. Perhaps, especially if we're leaders of this church in whatever capacity or in our jobs, we feel that we need to stay positive all the time. But today, in our service, in the presence of the God who sees and who knows everything and who loves us, I'd just like to offer us a space for us to be able to say to God, I'm not okay this morning. And God sees and he understands and he holds us in his arms. And when we read the Psalms, we find that the Psalmist is always saying to God, I'm not okay. And so we're gonna start our service today with Psalm 13. And let's listen to how he asked God for help. Psalm 13, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I, Lord, trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Let's take a moment of quiet and... Just say to God how you're feeling. And if you're not okay, just tell him you're not okay. The theme this morning is come and see. It's an invitation from Jesus to you and to me to come and see. We've come together into the presence of our Lord. So let's quieten our hearts and minds. Let's put aside our concerns and our distractions and open ourselves to listen for God's voice, for the word that he has for his children, you and me today. Let's pray. Almighty God, you speak to us in so many ways. Help us in our worship today to hear your voice and know that it's you speaking to us. Speak to us in the silence, through scripture and by your spirit. Speak in ways that we can understand. So speak, Lord and help us to listen. Open our eyes so we can see you. Let us come and see. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. 
I'm sure that many of you are already aware that this year, 2021, is going to be the year of discipleship in Salem. That's what John and I are going to be concentrating on um, in our praying and our teaching for the church. And so what does that mean for it to be the year of discipleship? Well, really, it just means that we're going to be looking at what it means to follow Jesus and what it means in particular to follow Jesus in real life, not just on Sunday in our normal life, our life of sleeping and working, cooking and eating, spending money, walking, doing Zoom meetings, looking after the family, teaching children at home, and so on. And we want to ask the question, what difference does it make? If I'm a follower of Jesus, what difference does it make to the way that I do all these things? That's going to be our question. <clears throat> so we need to equip ourselves with some tools to do this well. And one of the top tools that people have always had for uh, discipleship has been reading the Bible. As Christians, we believe that the Bible is different from other books because we believe that its words are living words, words which give life to us. And we actually believe that God speaks to us through its pages. And so it's important for us to know how to read the Bible if we want to be followers of Jesus. Because reading the Bible isn't like reading a novel. You don't start at page one and you carry on to, to the last word. If you try to do this, particularly if you're a newcomer to reading the Bible, you're going to be very quickly discouraged, probably just about when you get to Leviticus, I would guess, if not before. But there are lots of ways of reading the Bible which help us to actually hear the living word of God. Wouldn't you like to hear what God is saying to you personally today? And there are ways of doing that. And today we're going to try one of those ways, um, one of the ancient ways of reading the Bible. That's called Lectio Divina. Now, I've spoken about this before. Many of you will have heard me speak about it, but that's OK. Um, and Lectio Divina is a Latin word which means holy reading. <clears throat> and it couldn't be simpler. It's got a posh name, but it couldn't be simpler. It's got several steps and we'll go through it one by one today. And the first step is very simply to ask God to speak to us through the, the words of the Bible that we're about to read. And so let's start by doing that, just praying to God and asking him to speak to us through today's Bible reading. Let's pray.
loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning because we're very keen to hear what you want to say to us through your word, both as individuals, but also as a church. And so please help us to pay attention to what you want us to hear in this reading. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Paula, I have seen your message and perhaps after the readings, if you want to jump in there with the notices or did you want to do them straight away now? If I do them straight away now, because I don't want to spoil your spiritual hour gilch. <laughs> <laughs> you do them straight away now and then we'll go on to our evening. Uh, sorry about this, but my connection is particularly bad this morning. So just to say um, a warm welcome to you all from me as well and to Rosa as well. And uh, we're looking forward to the message now. Um, next week will be Alan Davis for the 1030 service. And a reminder that we have a, a date for Bridget's funeral. It is the 27th of January at 11.15. And that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. OK, so uh, we're going to return to our Lectio Divina. What we're going to do is we're going to hear today's passage three times. Now, this is not a passage I have chosen at random. This is the passage in the lectionary. I was quite astonished, as so often happens, how well it fits with our theme. And so first, Irene is going to read it to us from John chapter 1, verses 35 to 51. So if you want to follow in your Bibles, it's John chapter 1, 35 to 51. And this is the second step of the Lectio Divina. So first we pray to ask for God for help in hearing what he wants us to say. And then we listen and we listen or we read the Bible version passage three times. And it can be helpful if it's done in three different versions or if you know several languages in three different languages, maybe Welsh and English. Today, we're going to hear it read in three different voices. So first, Irene is going to read John chapter 1, 35 to 51. And as she reads, and as Dan and Andrea read, listen out. Is there a word or a phrase that jumps out at you? And if there is, you might want to put it in the chat. Thank you, Irene. <clears throat> Can I check if I've been unmuted? Yes. yes. Thank you. John 1, verses 35 to 51. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning round, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard that G John had said, and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought them to Jesus, him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Beth Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. 
When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, here is the true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Amen. Thank you, Irene. We're going to go over to Daniel now, who's going to read the same reading. And once again, look out to see if any phrase or word strikes you. And if it does and you want to share it, feel free to put it in the chat if you're able to do so. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning round, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Thank you, Daniel. And we're going to hear the reading one last time. And Andrea is going to read it to us. And again, just pay attention to anything that leaps out to you. Right, reading from verse 35. The following day, as John was standing with two of his disciples, Jesus walked by. John looked at him intently and then declared, see, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples turned and followed Jesus, Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want, he said. Sir, they replied, where do you live? Come and see, he said. So they went with him to the place where he was staying and were there with him from four o'clock on and that afternoon until the evening. One of these men was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew then went to find his brother Peter and told him, we have found the Messiah and he brought Peter to meet Jesus. Jesus looked intently at Peter for a moment and then said, you are Simon John's son, but you shall be called Peter the Rock. The next day, 
Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and told him, come with me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip now went off to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the Messiah, the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth? explained Nathaniel. Can anything good come from there? Just come and see for yourself, said Philip. As they approached, Jesus said, here comes an honest man, a true son of Israel. How do you know what I'm like? Nathaniel demanded. And Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Nathaniel replied, Sir, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe all this just because I told you I'd seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater proofs than this. You will even see heaven open and the angels of God coming back and forth to me, the man of glory. Thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> so we pray to God and we listen to our Bible reading three times. And now we go to the next step. And in this step, it's very helpful to think of the Bible as a mirror. So when you look in the mirror, and at the moment with Zoom, we're always looking at ourselves on the screen, aren't we? My colleague said to me, I can no longer conduct a meeting, which I can't see my face. <laughs> and when you look at yourself in the mirror or on Zoom, you notice things, don't you? Like, you know, you look in the mirror, you think, gosh, I need a haircut or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is you notice. And in the same way, when we look into the Bible passage, in this, in this very deliberate and intentional way, it acts as a mirror. And God shows us what we need to see and what we need to hear. And so maybe God will bring some word or some phrase to our attention. Maybe a question has come up about the reading that you don't understand. And so the third part of Lectio Divina is just really to think about what stood out for me, if anything, and why? Why did that phrase strike me? Is there something that I'm wrestling with in my life that that's relevant to? Does it chime with something of my past experience or my future hope? Is God trying to say something to me about my life? Maybe a promise or a request to change something. And once you've had a little think about this, and if you're doing this at home, you'll be able to take a little bit longer over it. You can pause the video and do it properly. We move to the fourth phase of Lectio Divina, and that is to pray. And this is the bit where we turn to God, and just like a child sitting with a beloved parent, we talk to God about whatever has come up in our heart and our minds as we were listening to that passage. Perhaps we will want to praise God for some encouragement that the passage gives us. Perhaps we will need to ask for forgiveness if it brings to mind something that we've done wrong. Perhaps we will need to ask for help to do something or for ourselves or for something else, someone else. Whatever it is, this is a time to speak openly to God and to trust in him. Let's just take a, a brief moment to do that. As I say, if you do this at home, you can take as long as you like, but we'll just take a brief moment now together to do that. And when you do this at home, I suggest that you end your time by just having a period of quiet where you just rest in God's arms, in the arms of the God who knows you and who loves you. And some people also find it helpful to keep a diary where they write down the phrase that struck them that day. Now, I see we've had some contributions from different people in the chat. That's great. Um, about the phrase that have struck them. So um, 
The weavers, one of them, have said, come and you will see, verse 39. And they've also given us verse 50, you will see greater things than that. Paula was struck by, follow me. And Carol, what are you looking for? Jesus's question in verse 38. Now, I do this exercise every time I prepare a sermon or a passage for us together in church. And what struck me this time when I was doing Lectio Divina in order to prepare this sermon was the same one as the weavers. It was the phrase, come and see. Of course, it doesn't mean it's the right answer. Let me just make this very clear. Uh, God will speak to each of us in our own individual way. There is no right answer. But because that's what struck me, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of the sermon. But you... If something different has struck you, I'd really encourage you to go and talk to God about that after the service and just try to work out why that phrase struck you. When Jesus calls the first disciples, he doesn't say to them, go and go down to the local college and do a degree in theology. He doesn't tell them to go away and read a book. All he tells them is to follow him. Come and see. And of course, this is one of the reasons why YouTube is so popular today. I've got a friend who has a, a 10 year old son and she was telling me that uh, her son got home from school a little bit earlier. So neither she nor her, her husband were home and the 10 year old was at home alone and he was hungry. So he decided to open a tin of baked beans and heat it up on the hob. And mum got home shortly after that. And she said, well, I didn't know that you knew how to use a tin opener. I didn't know how you, that you knew how to use the hob. And he said, oh, I didn't, but I just went on YouTube on my phone and I watched a video about how to use a tin opener. And it's true, isn't it? This is how we learn. We learn by watching somebody who knows how to do it already. Much, much easier to learn like that. And of course, that's why there's a compulsory practical element to most qualifications. If you want to be a minister, you have to go on a placement in a church. If you want to be a teacher, <clears throat> you've got to go and do teaching practice. If you want to be a doctor or a nurse, you have to spend time on hospital wards and in surgeries. Every learner must come and see. And it's exactly the same for us when we want to become learners, followers of Jesus. Jesus is looking at us right now in the year 2021. And when we say to him, Lord, where are you in our difficult lives today in the middle of this pandemic? Jesus says to us, come and see. For three years, Jesus spent nearly every second of his days and his nights with his disciples. They would eat together. They would walk together. The disciples were there when Jesus told stories. They were there when he healed people. They were there when he argued with his enemies. The disciples would watch when Jesus prayed and when Jesus spent time with God. The disciples were there watching when Jesus was arrested and killed. And the disciples were witnesses of his resurrection. Come and see. And the same is still true of us today. If you and I want to be disciples of Jesus, we must spend time with him. We must spend time watching what he does and listening to what he says. And today we can do this through reading the New Testament, where we can be amazed by the things that Jesus does. And as I've already said, we can do this also by spending time with him every day in prayer, trying to hear his voice speaking to us through his Holy Spirit. You see, when Jesus was about to die, his disciples were very upset, as you can imagine, when he told them that he was going to die. And they, one of the reason, things they were really worried about was how on earth were they going to cope on their own? But when they expressed this worry to Jesus, this is how Jesus replied. And I'm going to read it to you now from John chapter 14. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I'll ask the father and he'll give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I won't leave you orphan, I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. 
on that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them, they are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. So this is the promise of Jesus, that we will never be on our own, because he's always with us through his Holy Spirit. Come and see. Jesus is here. There is no substitute for spending time in the company of the great master. There is no other way of becoming his disciple. And, you know, when somebody spends time day after day in the company of Jesus, two things happen. And there are two things that we can spot. It's evidence. The first one is that person slowly, imperceptibly, becomes more and more like Jesus. Now, if you're a parent, you'll have had that wonderful experience of hearing your words come out of your son or daughter's mouth. And if you're an adult, you will have had that experience of thinking, oh my goodness, I'm turning into my mother or my father. Because of course, the thing is, if you spend time with someone, you just become like them. It's just how it works. And this is how the Bible describes what happens to people who spend time with Jesus. Paul writing to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Wow, what a promise. You and me, as we spend time with Jesus, we are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Come and see, says Jesus. And when we come to Jesus and we see, we become more like him. So that's the first thing that happens when somebody spends more time with Jesus. And the other thing that happens as somebody spends more time with Jesus is this. They start to see Jesus everywhere. When they look at our hospitals, full of COVID and sickness, instead of just seeing despair and fear, they begin to see and to recognize the words and the hands of Jesus in the words and the hands of the nurses and the doctors and the families who are looking after their loved ones. When they go out for their daily walk, they start to see the glory of God in every flower they start to see the hope of the resurrection in the new life that's beginning to grow already in our gardens and our fields. Come and see, says Jesus. And when we come, we truly see. But you know, the really interesting thing about this come and see is that it doesn't come up just once in the reading, it comes up twice. Because Jesus says to the disciples, come and see. And then he says to Philip, follow me. And then when Philip goes to tell his friend Nathaniel about Jesus, and Nathaniel's a bit dubious, saying, are you sure he's really the Messiah? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip says to, Nath to Nathaniel, come and see. And that's what you and I also need to do. We need to say to our friends, come and see. Come and see this Jesus who has brought love and forgiveness to my life. And sometimes I think we worry about doing that. We worry that we don't know all the answers. We worry that we're not experts about the Bible or whatever it may be. But that really doesn't matter. Jesus doesn't expect us to have all the answers any more than Philip had all the answers. Jesus doesn't expect us to be theological experts any more than those first fishermen whom Jesus called would have been theological experts. The only thing that Jesus calls us to do is to say to our friends, come and see. Come and see this Jesus who has changed my life. Because you know, it's not me and you who save people. It's not me and you who forgive sins. It's not me and you who destroy death and bring new life. It's not us. It's Jesus. And as his disciples, 
we have two jobs. One is to follow him as closely as we can. The, uh, the Jews in Jesus' time, they had a saying, to walk in the dust of your rabbi. In other words, to walk so closely to your master that you're covered by the dust that his sandals kick up from the road. That's our first job, to walk in the dust of our rabbi Jesus. And the second job that we have is to say to our friends, come and see, come and see this Jesus who's changed my life. Let's just take a, a moment of quiet and then we're going to sing a song which may be unfamiliar to some of you. It's a Graham Kendrick song, it was very popular some years ago. Come and see, come and see, come and see the King of Love. There's quite a long intro to it and then um, you can start singing. <laughs> Hopefully you'll work it out. Let's have a moment of quiet and then we'll, we'll play this.
Let us pray. Lord, we come before you to say sorry. Sorry for all the times that we've let you, ourselves and others down. Sometimes, Lord, we're so busy talking and doing that we fail to hear you. We miss that still small voice saying, stop. Listen. Follow me. Come and see. Lord, we're sorry for being too busy to hear you. You speak in so many different ways, Lord. But very often we take no notice and continue in our own way. Help us to tune into your voice. Lord, as you use others to speak to us, so you use us to draw people to you. Not just through words, because people see our lives and our attitudes and our character. And Lord, we are sorry for the times we've let you down in these areas. Show us anything for which we need to say sorry and change our ways. Father God, we thank you that we don't have to earn your forgiveness. It's not based on how worthy we are. We're forgiven through Christ Jesus. It is by grace that our sins are forgiven. We join now in praying for the people of the world who are waiting to hear good news. Loving God, we pray for the states of America to be united in the days and weeks ahead. We pray for an end to violence. We pray for wisdom and protection for President-elect Joe Biden and all who will take office in a few days time. We pray for those threatening to disrupt the inauguration and for the police force and those entrusted with keeping the law and the peace. We pray for those around the world at the mercy of extreme weather conditions. We pray for the people of Japan of Indonesia, especially those rescue workers who died trying to save others, for those bereaved in the plane crash, for those in our own country without power and heat. We pray for those tackling the climate change challenges of our time and for our own response in our day-to-day -day lives. We pray for all those who are pushed to their limits at work and at home, for intensive care staff, for all in the emergency services, for GPs, teachers and school staff, for ministers, politicians and community leaders, for parents and students, for all whose mental health is at breaking point. We pray for our government and all whose decisions affect millions of lives. And we pray for one another as we respond to the restrictions locally and nationally. We pray for those whose businesses are closed, whose shops are locked up, whose rooms have no guests, for those whose money is running out, for those on the brink of despair. We pray for your church, entrusted with the good news of Jesus and charged with serving all those in need. We pray particularly this week for the families of Wyndham Johnson and Les Smith and Bridget Watley White. We pray for hospital chaplains, for those ministering to the bereaved, and for one another as we seek to share our faith and our hope in Jesus Christ by saying to our friends, come and see. Lord Jesus, you said in our reading, what are you looking for? 
we pray for those we love who don't know what they are looking for and pray that they might find hope and new life in you. We thank you, God, for those times when we've sensed your presence, heard your voice and seen new insights, particularly when we've needed those things. We thank you for your promises in the reading that we will see great things, we will see heaven open. And we pray for those of us who need a bit of encouragement this week that you will reveal yourself to us. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing our final song now, which I know is a, a great Salem favourite. We've got um, Stuart Townend singing The Lord's My Shepherd. Such encouraging words in these difficult times. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. I think I know what's wrong. Just give me one minute and I will sort it out. <laughs> I need to get the sound playing across the slides and I must have forgotten to do that. Sorry about that. Just give me one minute and we will sing it again. Right, I'm having a bit of trouble with it. So what I am going, oh, hang on a minute. I might be able to do it here. No, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna let Stuart Townend sing and you can join in. If you don't know the words, just come along. I think I'll just do it that way. Sorry about that. <clears throat> the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures. me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul, and I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. Yeah. Hey.
Lord God, what I pray for each one of us is this, that whatever may happen to us today and in the next week, we will keep hearing this verse in our heads, that your endless mercy follows us and your goodness will bring us home and that you would help us to trust in you alone. And so I pray a blessing upon all of us here a blessing of peace and of joy and a blessing of knowing your presence with us wherever we may go, whatever we may do this week. Amen.